So that's me. And the t-shirt, like we always have t-shirts and these retreats. So the t-shirt this year was, is presence ever absent? That's very esoteric. Next year, it'll be don't fall. We'll keep it really, really simple. Best, that's what I tell everyone now. <laughs> so that's that, okay. Um, but anyway, people have sent me best wishes and, and I'm, I'm so, so grateful to everyone. All the TLC obviously helps with the healing. Um, so the, the, I think we had a theme for the talk, correct, Bita? Which was the theme for the three-day retreat in Singapore, which was uh, Give Peace a Chance, was that it? Yeah, so it's obviously from a Beatles song. All we are saying if, 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 is give peace a chance. You wonder how peaceful John Lennon was. I don't sure, um, but it's a good question because we all really do want peace. It's something we all, when we feel it in a place or in a person or in an environment, in a community, we obviously treasure and value that. And it's a, it's a huge thing. We could go all, all, you know, in many, many places. But one of the ways you can consider it is just to kind of consider how monastic life works, because that's the model I have of cultivating peace. Now, not, I'm not saying that everyone should be a monastic, but there are certain principles in monastic life which are, which are quite interesting for reflection. The most obvious ones are lifestyle. And the lifestyle of a monk is, uh, is based on, on one thing. It's based on a rule of law. We have a Vinaya. We have a rule called the Vinaya from, from the time of the Buddha, which we all agree to. And that creates a certain amount of peace in the atmosphere. So in larger society, if we're going to give peace a chance, I think rule of law is very, very important. If that's not there, we're in trouble. And, and we see that all over the world. Uh, also, like a monk's, a monk is, the monk's basic, basic requisites are food, shelter, clothing, medicine, and dhamma. And that, that really, you know, when, when you think about it, if a culture has, uh, Dhamma would be education. If a culture, if everyone in the culture can have a good education, if everyone can have good health care, if everyone has housing, if everyone is well fed, then everyone's got a chance of somehow fulfilling themselves in whatever they might. But if those things are not there, the society gets gets in, in real real trouble. So those are obvious things, I think, but they are they are not to be forgotten that as uh, as societal beings, not just meditative beings, uh, we have a certain responsibility to try to make that possible in little ways or small ways in, in, the, in the situations that, that, that we live in. So then if we, if we can kind of then consider um, monastic life further, there's certain kind of principles that it's like a social agreement that we have as, as monastics. And one of the social agreements we have that we try to practice by is contentment with little. And that is done by all of us sharing our resources. And contentment with little, santuti, I think in Pali, I'm not sure, I think that's it, um, is obviously a huge part of being peaceful. If my, if my standards of food, fashion, comfort, all that are very, very high, then I have to put a lot of resources in maintaining that, and then I'm not very, very adaptable. Now, as a, as a monk in Thailand, I wasn't, I wasn't content with little, but it was a social principle that helped me look at discontent and the peaceful and the lack of peace when I was discontent. So like in the early days of the monastic life, one of the big perks that I, could, I couldn't get, I was too junior, but if I could get a hut, a kuti, with mosquito screens, this would be the highest luxury. And if you didn't, and, then, and that, that took like, 
I'd have to be a monk of about five years maybe to get that. Maybe they have it now. So that was luxury, mosquito screens. And if you didn't have mosquito screens, well, you slept in a mosquito net, which was quite uh, stuffy. So my greed mind <laughs> would, would hanker after I want a mosquito screen. And, but then the reflection was, no, 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 no. You're a monk now. Be content with little. So I had to adapt to a stuffy mosquito screen, uh, a mosquito net in a hot climate, which I wasn't used to. But it wasn't killing me. It was actually very good for me to have a, a more ascetic kind of uh, principle. If I had to do it now, it'd be much more difficult. But at least I understand the principle of contentment with little. And so when we have a principle like that in Dhamma, the danger of, 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 a, of a principle like that is that it becomes an ideal rather than a reflection. And an ideal then becomes a kind of inner tyranny. I should be content with little is different than, oh, discontent is like this. I'm going to look at discontent because discontent is not peaceful. Now, if I'm starving or I've done my shoulder in or in no shelter, I say, no, no. This discontent is important. I need to look at this discontent, like my shoulder hurts. I need to go to the doctor. So it's not some kind of ascetic self-mortification. It's a very reasonable kind of thing. That's a very strong principle I learned in my early years in time. Content with a little. And, and then also, I would say gratitude that, that one has that. So that's the way I try to train my mind. My conditioned mind of a culture which had a lot lived in Toronto, ate what I wanted, and so on and so forth. Now I lived in a culture which was uh, poor in economic standard, but not poorer in the heart. And so there was, there was the discontent, but then I could also go, yeah, but these people are giving me their very best. So I start to use my mind to look at discontent, which is not peaceful, and move to something which is peaceful, gratitude. I, I think that's quite obvious. It's obvious, but quite often we forget to do something like that. And this is what we mean by a practice. You know, it's a practice, a reflective practice, contentment with little, rather than an ideal that I should always be content with little. That will never work because you won't always be like that. So the difference between contemplation and idealism is, is terribly important. Another thing which is in monastic life is sense restraint. Now, we, I'm in Bangkok right now, and we drive along Sukhum, Sukhumvit, we go, uh, and we go to this hospital, which is probably, well, it's, it's not far, but it's far in terms of humanity. There's all kinds of people and cars and, and traffic jams and noise, and it is amazing. So it's definitely a place where you get stimulated a lot. Now, if you come to Tissa and you go to Wampapong, the silence is exquisite. The silence is really exquisite. So environment does help. And, but if you have work, if you work in Toronto or you work in Bangkok, you can't necessarily go to the monastery. So sensory straight, I think, is also um, like, like really developing the capacity not to just be out all the time, uh, in whatever way. And I, I'd say to people must develop that capacity to compose the mind and not be pulled out all the time. And that's a very personal discipline. But at least to have a space, if possible, in your own home where silence, uh, less, less distraction uh, is, is a part of your environment. And that's so, so very helpful. But you do the best you can give peace a chance. You have to take care of your body. Your body is your vehicle, right? Now, I didn't take care, well, I fell, so you better take care of the shoulder because this is my vehicle. It's getting older and more and more difficult. And so not to use the body for pleasure or work, not to just push the body for pleasure or work because that is your vehicle. That's it you have to take care of. Having said that, we get sickness. We fall, we have illness, we have Lyme's disease, we get all, all kinds of things. So all of those things are very, very helpful. Lifestyle, 
uh, restraint, contentment with little, morality, that we live a moral life, um, that we live a generous life. So that those are such basic, basic, basic principles in Buddhism, morality and generosity in the way we relate to each other. Without those, it's pretty hard to be peaceful. If I'm just considering how I can manipulate you to get what I want, and I'm never generous to anyone, my heart's not gonna be very, very peaceful or happy. So generosity and sense restraint and moral restraint are a huge part of peace, obviously. And, and to kind of uh, emphasize that, I just like to, me and, me and Bita have made a bit of a plan on this talk. We don't usually plan talks, but we have a lovely clip from Firefly Mission. And Firefly Mission come out of Singapore and they are a philanthropic group who do a lot of uh, philanthropic work in Southeast Asia. And last year they built seven schools in Laos. So this is quite inspiring to see how uh, a group of people can put a lot of effort forth in the way of dana, in the way of generosity, and then the joy that that creates in their minds and the minds of the recipients. So Bita, can we do that one? All right, thumbs up, here we go. that we can give to a child is the gift of truth and through building this school we are providing the center of learning and as what i understand this is the best school in this uh, village in this area so hopefully they can get more students we hope that uh, this will provide them a better environment and um, they have a better education. link with the uh, Laos actually to uh, brother Christopher and uh, brother Peter and uh, when the brother William joined us the uh, program really take off and uh, even during the COVID disruption the school building progress continue and uh, it's the most uh, progressive uh, country of all the uh, country that Firefly Mission have uh, present. to study hard, huh? to grow up, to become magnificent adults.
firefly with your little sparkle, your selfless energy, flickering in dedicated units, lighting up life's bleak darkness, bringing light, hope, love, joy, compassion, and happiness. Sewing and leaving behind wonderful works and legacy for generations to come. Nurturing the young to know that our only joy and reward is the warmth of the sweet smile those young innocent faces. Shone on fireflies, for the light may dim the legacy of the more. Jia Yu Fireflies. So that's inspiring, isn't it? Makes you want to cry in a good way. So these these uh, these are human principles. They're not Buddhist principles, but they, you know, touching the heart in these ways is is very, very important because much of our spiritual work, our inner work, is not so easy. And like every family has its tragedies and betrayals and lots of difficulties. Life's not easy. So to inject the generosity of joy and caring is so, I mean, we know that. That's very, very important. And I just thought, you know, Firefly is such an inspiring uh, organization of really hardworking people that, that make these things possible. And have also supported us and they also have organized retreats. So um, as they say, I wanted to shout out their, their goodness and realize that Buddhism isn't, especially for, for folk from like a kind of mindfulness background, obviously Buddhism isn't just about mindfulness and meditation. It's about our whole lifestyle and doing as much as we can in all these different areas. So classically, we have dana and sila, generosity, which is the active part of our life, and then moral restraint, which where we, we don't act on things, even though we have the impulses. And then a lifestyle which has some composure in it, some collectedness in it, some sense of restraint, and not just being drawn into the fads, fashions, passions of the news cycles or, or fashion cycles or whatever uh, can distract us. Now, obviously, even though all these things are in place, the inner world still plays its tricks on us. And certainly my early days in Thailand were very difficult. Had lots of uh, lots of loneliness and, and anger and fear and hunger. Sometimes I, I couldn't digest the food, so you know it wasn't very easy for me. But the fact that uh, Long Pao Cha was such a beautiful being, and the fact that the others were other monks were so strong and so diligent. Uh, gave me what's so crucial in any social situation is Kalyanamitta, spiritual friends. And that's a big part of give peace a chance because if I have spiritual friends, when I'm down, they'll help me. Or when I'm being an arrogant fool, they'll tell me <laughs> in, in whatever way I need. And that's a true spiritual friend um, who, who, who shows you your faults, but not in a cruel way and who, who uplifts your good qualities in a good and inspiring way. And, and I've been very, very fortunate that I, as a monk, I have so many Kalyanamitta and I continue to meet more people. Um, and I realize sometimes lay lives can be lonely. Maybe no one in family is into Dhamma or in the business place or in the workplace, perhaps there isn't much Dhamma. So it can sometimes be a bit of a lonely path, but when, when needs to somehow find 
it's helpful to find Kalyanamitta. And, and a spiritual friend is one who doesn't necessarily agree with you, but has the capacity of listening, I would say. I mean, they obviously have to have, you know, a sense of morality and a sense of Dhamma in their lives, but they, the capacity, as I think Thich Nhat Hanh uses the phrase deep listening, where someone can like be with you and not say, uh, I, I agree or I disagree or, or, or make any comment, but actually, first of all, recognize your humanity by listening. And then when you listen, when we listen to each other, then of course we can understand each other. We can share our, our joys and sorrows. So the kind of idea of deep listening is, is, is actually, it's a really good thing in our modern society when we have that kind of language um, of communication, which isn't just about talking or sharing views and opinions, but it's actually saying, hey, you're a human being, you suffer. How do you suffer or how do you be happy? And I'll listen to you and you'll listen to me. And that is obviously so very important uh, and, and crucial in give peace a chance. So one could, I could go on about different kinds of social dimensions and I could maybe talk about ecology. Like if, you're, if your house is flooding, you, you're, you're just gonna try to survive. So there's all those issues, but that, that would be too, too great a task. But what I wanted to perhaps dwell on in terms of your inner work is, um, well, first of all, the fact is that to do the inner work, one has to develop a witnessing posture or a witnessing attitude or awareness or mindfulness of one's inner world. This is, um, I mean, it's self-evident, but many people of course don't realize that they are not their thoughts, which is shocking. You know, if you believe you're your thoughts, you're finished. <laughs> it's, there's no hope. So the thoughts that we have and the emotions that come up can be vi witnessed as objects in consciousness and awareness. That's the entry point to contemplation, isn't it? That's, that's how you get into the ball game. That's how you get into the stadium of contemplation. Um, but what, I, what is sometimes disconcerting about mindfulness practice or awareness practices is that Sometimes life even seems worse, your inner life. And I, and I certainly found that in my early years in, at Wapapong was because I wasn't distracting anymore. I had no places to go to if I felt lonely. I had no, to, I had no one to blame if I felt angry because everyone is actually quite nice. Um, I, I couldn't just distract myself with food or get the food I wanted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, greed, hatred, and delusion actually seem to be amplified. I seem to get more angry sometimes or, or, or more greedy. Uh, in like, I think many of the monks who, who were there in, the, in that period, the food was very, very, uh, it wasn't poor. It was good according to their standards, but our bodies just couldn't adapt to the food. So we were, most of us were super thin. Um, and, and, and then we'd have incredible greed for like a mango. I mean, who's greedy for a mango? How could you be greedy for a mango? And it would, it would, it would surprise me at how, like if, <laughs> if, a, if a monk next to me got a bigger mango than me, I feel jealous of his mango. I mean, like logically, come on, man, you're, you're, you're 26 years old and you're, you're jealous about a mango. And, and that was very disappointing. But this, this kind of, this speaks to something that people often need to remember is the idea, we have a, a word called anusaya. And anusaya is latent tendency. So, or, or you could maybe analogous to like, we have buttons, buttons get pressed. So when my mango button, greed button got pressed, now I got pressed because I couldn't get what I wanted. I was actually hungry. So that's quite logical. But then when, when the greed came up, uh, that's like a latent tendency. And that had been built up to some extent because when I wanted to eat, I could eat whatever I wanted to as a layman. Now I couldn't. So the greed became um, uh, amplified in ways which are embarrassing. I mean, I'd never tell anyone that. 
I never tell the other monks, wow, I really was hankering for your mango. You know, I would never say that. I keep it to myself, but it was very, very true. So the, the arising of the greed seemed to be worse, but actually now I was finally becoming conscious of greed as an object because I couldn't just follow my greed, right? So being, and, and this is like forced monasticism, Lompa Cha's tradition very much is frustrating desire. If Lompa Cha was asked, what's your method? He'd say frustration. <laughs> he wouldn't say Anapanasati or Metta Bhavana or Paticca something, you know, he'd say, uh, yeah, frustration. And, and not, not in a cruel way, but in a way that actually edified the, the monk or, or, or the practitioner. So I began to see, wow, this, this greed is really, really strong. But, but because I'm, I'm now taking a witness posture, I'm not just running away to the fridge every, every chance I get because I don't have a fridge <laughs> and I just have to be with the way things are. Then I begin to make conscious the feeling of greed as an object rather than me being the subject who is now greedy and who's chasing something or, or, or whatever. Greed became uh, an object in awareness, a sankara, and that is the beginning of the end of greed. Why is it beginning of the end of greed? Because I am no longer identifying with it, but it still has this momentum to come into consciousness. So the analogy that we use is the analogy of, of a fire. And let's say you've got a, a, a wood stove in our kutis, we have wood stoves and you fill it up with wood and you start the fire off. The fire is gonna run for a certain amount of time and it'll run out when the fuel is run out. If you put more fuel on, it'll run longer. So the, the fueling, what would be the fueling of greed in this kind of very coarse example, the fueling of greed would be that I wouldn't notice it as an object and I would either repress it and think, oh, you're terrible. You shouldn't be hankering after mangoes <laughs> or, or I would follow it. I'd do one or the other. And that would be putting more fuel on the habit, on the latent tendency. But when I witness greed, and it's not wrong. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just a natural phenomena. And, and, I, and I began to see it as an object. Then this kind of hankering for all the things that I had before, music and sex and all these different things, I began to see those are just movements in consciousness. And my real home is not that. It's not greed. It's the awareness of greed as an object. Then the fires... And the, 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 then the fuel, the, then the fire of greed is no longer being stoked. I'm not putting any more fuel on it, which is the idea of upadana. And if you don't understand that, then you can feel quite guilty or, or my practice isn't working or I should be doing some kind of method. But actually, the fact that I am conscious of some form like this is actually the beginning of its end. If, 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 if I trust in awareness, and I know that this will change. So that was the same with me with, with um, uh, anger and, and fear and these kinds of conditions. So I began, and Lompoc, and Lompoc Sameda would say, no, it's a good thing. And, and I think you've heard that language where he said, consciousness is the escape hatch. And it, it's very, very true. And things come up into consciousness and you recognize them as not yours really. They're just latent tendencies, the stream of consciousness, there's sankara, there's stuff, whatever you want to call it. And you, you, and you have the courage to witness even like fear or jealousy or whatever it is. You say, it feels this way as Lompo Sumedho, it feels this way. You bear with it. That fuel is burning because it has the potential to burn your buttons, but it's now burning away and it's coming to cessation. And this is the idea of Niroda the cessation of suffering. It takes a lot of courage and, and determination and, and, and endurance to often go through this kind of thing. But if you understand the principle, then you start to have a kind of uh, self-motivation saying this is a good thing. If it's overwhelming, then it's not a good thing. Then you burn out or whatever. So it has to be kind of a safe environment. So if I'm feeling fear, in an environment which is dangerous, that's a good thing. Get out of there. 
But if I'm feeling fear and it's a safe environment, something's, something's triggered off the fear, then if I have the courage, patience, understanding, wisdom, awareness, to know fear is fear, to be conscious of fear as an object, goes through the body, goes through the mind, has its language, has its memories, and I, 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 I say it's okay, fear feels this way, then that's the beginning of the end of fear. It might take a few years, but what else works? Does distraction work? I don't think so. Does repression work? I don't think so. Does blame work? No, I don't think so. So where upadana or attachment or more fuel uh, engages and, 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 and causes a problem is obviously in thinking. Because when I attach to the thinking mind around the fear, I am no longer aware of fear. I am the fearful being who is thinking. So somehow we have to come to the silent witnessing of fear as an object rather than the thinking fearful thoughts. So that's what I had to learn to do with things like fear. I just had to, first of all, make them conscious. So make conscious the feeling of fear. Make conscious the feeling of anger. And I, and I use that language very deliberately because, say, if, if you've been following Lompo, Lompo Sumedo's uh, talks of, of late and, and maybe for his whole career, um, you know, he'll, he'll say it's like this. Now, that's a very common phrase. It's like this. It's cold outside. It's like this. But it doesn't necessarily you're making conscious what this moment feels like. It can be just a dismissal. Oh, yeah, it's like that but you're not really aware, you're still in thought. You're still, you're not really, really conscious. Where is it, if you, if you take that statement, it's like this and you make conscious the present moment, truly, like in, 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 in viscerally in your body, in your mind, you're like, so it feels like this, your mind would be silent. You can only do that if your mind is silent. If you're thinking about your fear, or you're, you're, you're doing whatever with thought, then you're not with the fear. You're not with the present moment. You're not really conscious of the way things are. So silent attention becomes terribly important in the inner, in our, in our, in, in, in our, in, in the release of these anusaya, in the liberation of the mind from these habits of greed, hatred, and delusion. The, the doubting mind will try to fix it, try to get rid of it, try to do something about it. We're not trying to get rid of everything. We are living morally. We are trying to live generously. So if my, if the anusaya or the latent tendency that comes out of me wants to hurt someone, no, I practice sila. I don't do that. But I still witness it as it is. I make conscious the feeling of being frightened or being angry. And this, I think, is, is where sometimes mindfulness and it's like this in the Thai, we say Penyang um, It's not about control, but it is about being fully awake to the way things are. It's hard to do, isn't it? Because our minds are just kind of rattling on in thought, much of the time in thought. So in our, in our meditation, that's what we're trying to do is come to the, the silent stillness of awareness rather than an analysis of the way things are. And, and where I find people don't understand that one is in doubt. There's so many people ask me questions about this, that, or the other. And I, and, I, and I always say, well, it's just doubt. But they find it very, very difficult to look at doubt as an object. Like fear is easy to look at because fear has a lot of energy, has a lot of pressure. It's, it's not pleasant, but it's kind of very, very obvious. Whereas doubt, it's in the thinking mind. It, it's it's very deluding. It's one of the like a moha characteristic. So to actually to 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 realize that liberation will not happen through thought. You can use thought to direct your mind in a correct way, but thought is 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 always going to be very very uh, tentative, and the inability to no doubt is doubt will always lead to a question. An answer, a doubt, a question, an answer, a doubt. And that's, it's a very vicious cycle for meditators. And so I found like my emotional world became much more balanced, hopefully. And the fear started to go away. You know, the heart was more compassionate. 
but still sometimes oh, it, it, I must, I, I have to get something. I have to attain something because there's so much language in Theravada Buddhism of attainment, this stage, that stage, these insights, those insights. And then that would bring up doubt in my mind. What should I do? What should I get? And, and Lopo Samedo would say, well, it's just doubt. Yeah, yeah, but what should I do? Oh, well, it's just doubt. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, I know, but, but what should I do? <laughs> and it's, it's just doubt, Viridamo. It's just the mind not knowing. Yeah, but I want to know. No, 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 you have to know that you don't know. So, you know, it kind of got to get circular, but what does doubt feel like? That's not something we do. We, we think thoughts. So in, in, in normal life, you need to use doubt to solve problems, sure. But in, in the life of liberation, we're not looking for something, like something in the future. We're noticing that in the present moment, in the present moment, there is conscious awareness and that that's actually very silent. And that is our goal. It's not something in the future, not something we get later on. So, so doubt is both one of the fetters and one of the hindrances for those who have studied Theravada. And doubt is not solved through more thought. I, you know, I, I, sometimes you see people who, you know, they've read like tons of books, tons of books, uh, and, and they still doubt. So I said, well, why don't you stop reading? Well, because they have a doubt, then they read a book and get a concept. Well, wouldn't it, better, wouldn't it be better to go to silence? Wouldn't that be more interesting? Yeah, but I need to figure this out first. So there's a kind of habit in, 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 in a urban culture where most of us have some tertiary education. We think a lot, we analyze a lot. We, we, we use analysis and thought for our, our bread and butter. So that's a good thing. But I, I really don't think the liberation of the heart is gonna take place through thought because thought is still an object. So then as you refine the emotional part of the practice, then you start to get more subtle, I would say, analogies of the practice. And the one I've been using recently is foreground and background. So those of you who did retreats with me, like the foreground, of our is all experience are our, our, not only the, the things I see, like I see a pillow over here, a clock over here, a picture over there. I hear sounds, I hear the air conditioner. That's the foreground, but also my thoughts, my emotions, uh, my body, my memories, all of that is, is stream of consciousness and that's in the foreground. But the background, the background is the stillness of knowing. And once you, once you kind of understand that it's, don't worry about the foreground. Worry about the foreground if, you're, if your company's going bankrupt, yes. Uh, if your car hasn't got any petrol, yes. Worry about the foreground and don't fall. In that case, worry about the foreground. But, but the spiritual practice is not about the foreground. The foreground can prepare a kind of platform, good living, morality, generosity, that's the kind of platform which is helpful and gives us a, a good sense of being good human beings. But the background is very, very simple. It's silent, it's conscious, it knows, awareness. And if you can get that model going, and the way I, I sort of suggest people do that modeling, as you know, I, I just say, try sound, listen to sound. So I do that now. I can hear the quality of sound. If I pay attention to the air conditioner, I say, oh, the air conditioner is up there. It has that sound, I'm glad it's on, it's keeping the room cool. Then my mind is out in the foreground, correct? If, however, I then establish a different posture, I say, now I'm just gonna let sound come to me, come to awareness. Then I'm emphasizing the background, the background of still knowing which is not dependent on the sound. It doesn't matter what the sound's like. And if you, can, if you can play around that and get a feeling for the background, then when the foreground presents difficult mind states, you'll see that the, that foreground only becomes difficult when you start thinking self-thoughts around it. So if I have 
um, some kind of a doubt. And then I feed that with a hunker and mankar, self thinking, I thinking, my thinking, you get all kind of stuck in it. But if I say, oh, that's a thought, make conscious this feeling, right? Make conscious this moment, say, what does it really, really feel like to be sitting here now? And that will take you to the stillness of knowing. And if you, if you, I would say, if you then um, do that deliberately with something very simple like sound or bodily feeling, just see the difference. There is sound. Don't go out to the sound. Let the sound come to awareness. You start to, to emphasize the awareness. Then you, you, you begin to have this capacity to see that doubt is just an object. Self-thinking is an object. Emotions are objects. And you begin to find your real home. That, that your real home is that kind of silence. Um, now, what, what's, what's very important in all of this is to remember that we're also emotional beings. We're not just kind of intellectuals with some really cool ideas of philosophy, that we are we're blood and guts beings. <laughs> I know the blood in my shoulder. So, uh, but also we have heart. And, and, and when we learn how to, to, to relate to the moment more from the heart chakra than the head space, this is incredibly helpful because in the heart chakra, there, there's no real questioning. It just is as it is. And it's, it's, that's, that's where we find our connection. With the head, we're always criticizing and so on, which is important, but quite often we feel alienated. So a very, very simple practice to do is to begin to bring attention away from the thinking mind down to the heart, not to get anything, but to see, I can, I can relate to this moment through thought, but also I can relate through the heart chakra. And that's the receptive part of our being. And to me, that's very, very important because when, when you practice the Brahma Viharas, when you practice Metta, Mudita, Karuna, Upeka, when you practice uh, loving kindness and compassion, then you find the emotional fulfillment of the human possibility. So the enlightened being is not some kind of inner space, I wouldn't say. I had a good chance to meet the Solomonist, the Dalai Lama, or Ajahn Chah. These are not inert beings. They're beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful beings because their hearts are very much open. And yet their minds are very, very silent. And, and so to me, what's very important is moving to the silence of knowing, awareness, but also constantly trying to bring forth the heart chakra, relating from that. And then th things seem to find their own way in that way. But I, can't, I, I couldn't say that 50 years ago. 50 years ago, I said, will I survive tomorrow? <laughs> And I want a bigger mango. <laughs> but, but my teacher said, well, we're done well. Rompacha said, well, yeah, well, what did you expect? You're not trained. You're pretty pathetic, actually. And uh, give it five years. For what? So you might feel better. So he wasn't like, like saying, oh, you're doing great. You're done well. You know, just do more Anapanasati. He says, no, you're going to have to tough this out. You have to endure because what else could I do? I hadn't trained the mind. And I was so grateful for that straight, honest answer rather than some kind of patronizing statement about how wonderful I was or something like that. And it was true over the years, those coarser kinds of, of difficulties that I faced, they, they began to wane, but always the refuge is always the same. It always is the same, knowing the way things are. Uh, it's like this. Uh, Choiceless awareness, receptive attention, these different kinds of ways we talk about that. So that's a whole bunch of words. Um, Bita, maybe if anyone uh, is, wants to ask a question or, or, or whatever. And, and, and Tisterna, please go for breakfast. Limon cup. <clears throat> Thank you so much for the reflections, Lompo. Okay. We want to rejoice together with three sadhus. Andamayam o vadagatha sadhu karangadamase 
Sadhu, 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 Thank you so much, Don Paul. Um, for anyone who wants to ask a question, uh, feel free to click on the raise and button. This is an occasion for you to um, come into contact with Long Paul, especially for those in Singapore and Malaysia when you didn't have a chance to receive Long Paul. Now we have the pleasure of receiving Long Paul here virtually. So if you have a question, uh, click on the raise and button and uh, we'll invite you to unmute. Long Paul, um, whilst we're waiting for a question, uh, uh, perhaps um, if I think many of us um, are very glad that you know you, you are keeping well and we can see the Tisarena um, uh, community is also keeping well. Um, uh, the monastery is uh, very far from, from us here in Asia uh, and uh, we're all quite interested in, in the development in the monastery. Um, we understand that um, development of um, the infrastructure has been ongoing um, and perhaps Don Paul could just uh, give a little bit of update on uh, that, that progress for everyone. Well, thank you for asking. Um, well, the, the monastery has sufficient kutis for the Sangha and it has pretty good facilities for the monks, like showers and office and, and all of that. And what's really missing is a large uh, Dharma hall. And I think our, our Dharma hall presently can hold 20 people, 25 people. So it's, it's probably smaller than your bedroom or living room, something like that. Maybe not if you're Singapore. So this, need for a sala has been up there for, for, for quite a long time and we through the generosity of many 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 people we've been able to start it uh, we started it in april it got delayed because of covid prices shot up but because of very good friends in all over the world singapore malaysia and other places uh everyone of, of our supporters they said no you got to go for it you can't delay it now so we had enough money to to start and we weren't sure about closed in, but it's looking pretty good for a closed in stage. So um, if you go on our website, you'll see pictures of the Dhammasala and uh, we hope to have it closed in and usage permits by the next Katina, which would be November. That would be kind of optimistic, realistic uh, scenario. But anyway, it's a beautiful hall and um, uh, I think it, I was, I was, I just wrote to Michael the other day and I, I was saying how, how really pleased I am to be able, because I grew up in, this is my neighborhood, Tisna, Bangkok is not my neighborhood, but it is my neighborhood. I grew up in Ontario in Canada. So it's, it's the place that I am so grateful to, because I had a, a very good childhood and my parents are refugees from the second world war. And I was just thinking how nice it is that I can give something back to my society, that I can give a place and, and, a, and, a, and a cultural values, which I get from Buddhism, from Thailand and, and Southeast Asia and so on, that I can somehow make some effort to create that as a possibility in my own culture. And I'm kind of, I was really feeling lovely about that. And this, this, this Dharma hall, which now will serve many, many people, um, I think will kind of be a kind of pilgrimage place for, for people to, I think they'll be really attracted to it because it'll be like churches in Ontario usually are locked. And, that, and I always found that sad that the places of silent contemplation are locked. So, you know, why have it? So being a monastery, we can keep it open and people can go in and meditate and be quiet and, and so on. So we, it was much needed. And I think it will really, really enhance our, our community. Um, and other than that, well, monasteries grow according to the energy of, of, the, of the community. So I was thinking after this thing is built, we'll take a year and we just meditate for a year, <laughs> take a break from, because, you know, creating a, a, a monastic space in a non-Buddhist environment isn't so very straightforward because there are, you know, we're like an island of, 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 of Buddhist culture in, 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 a, in a very secular 
situation. People are kind. They're not, you know, it's a good country. Um, but it does take a, a considerable amount of, of determination to try to create a culture that is not against we uh, Western culture, but has its own value system that people can plug into. And, and that's what monasteries do. They create through the life of the monks and through the values that we try to uphold, people can come into a, a silent atmosphere which then gives them, I, I think, relief from the complexity of their own lives, gives them different modeling of, of how, uh, say, in our, in our case, men can live together. We have a bhikkhuni monastery near us. Um, and, and so we are a, a, we're a society or we're a culture that's running parallel to contemporary culture. Contemporary culture has its politics and has its fashion etc cetera, etc cetera. and we are indebted to that contemporary culture because our life depends on dana but we're not dependent on it politically socially and so on we have our own value system and that's i think been the strength of buddhist monasticism through the millennia that in you know whatever is going on in in larger culture we have our rules we have our rule of law we have our our basic principles and we try to keep to that and to me, that I think that's an incredibly valuable thing to bring into a society, not through advertising or, you know, not through that kind of uh, commercial way, but just through the silence and quietness of a place of, of peace. And, and, and so this hall is very important for that. I've always, when you build, I've been involved in several monasteries and when, when, a, when a meditation hall gets built, it's like, okay, this is, this is the center. This this is the place that really anchors the place in, in, into the into the into the culture into the atmosphere. So it's going well, and um, if you if you interested, you look on the website. But if you're more interested, come and visit. Don't come in May or June. There are too many mosquitoes. Uh, <laughs> come come at times when the bugs aren't out. Come in whenever you want, really. How's that, beat? Does that cover it, sort of? Thank you, Longfo. I've also uh, put up the uh, the link to the website uh, that that, um, that updates the development plans of uh, Serena. So, if anyone's interested, uh, please uh, feel free to follow uh, that link. Um, and and this is not an ask by by, by Longfo. This is really uh, an ask by me and and many of our organizers who uh, um, who feel very much for the Sangha in Cisarena. Uh, we would urge everyone to, uh, to consider looking after the welfare and the longevity of the Sangha such that we all can continue to benefit. Uh, please, um, it is a season of giving. Uh, do visit the Cisarena website and, uh, and uh, do a direct deposit <laughs> to the Cisarena uh, bank account. Um, and if you feel uh, uh, generous and uh, kind enough to support. Thank you, Bita. Thank you. There is a question from Amy. And the question is, thank you, Longpo, for the talk. We miss you here in Singapore, particularly at the Singapore Buddhist Mission. What, would, what advice would you give to young people who find it hard to be contented with little, especially in a competitive world where there's a lot of comparison uh, and to be a step ahead in the career and their life in general? Yeah, it's it's a con it's a consumer culture, and like we were talking the other day about brand names, and then someone indicated a, an article in the Guardian. It was quite funny article, but it was a it was a Prada <laughs> shirt, which didn't have sleeves, so it's just like an undershirt. And it costs 700 pounds <laughs> for something that's like worth two pounds. And it's the hottest item on the, on the pot of website. And I think, what kind of craziness is that? Why, why is that? Well, I mean, if you have the money, I suppose, go for it. But there is quite often a lack, like in young people, sometimes there's a lack of confidence in 
not being the same as the crowd, you know, having, I mean, it's an adult life too. So a lack of confidence in one's own values, peer group pressure to look a certain way, wear something, speak a certain way. And then peer group pressure is not Kalyanamitta. It's peer group pressure. And it's sometimes based on the lowest common denominator. It's not necessarily based on wisdom. So I think for that kind of peer group pressure, that's one of the issues that exists, is, is that one has Kalyanamitta who have, who have the strength to say, well, is that of any value? And am I doing this out of fear? Because quite often the reason we do these things is because of fear. We, we, you know, we're afraid what, what people will think because we're not wearing the right thing. So that's one, one of the things. If you have a, a group of people whose value system, it has great courage in it. And then what are our values? What is important? What should we be doing? That, that, that's very, very helpful. Um, but also consumer society is constantly stimulating us. And it's probably using the best psychologists that we have not the best maybe, but you know, they, 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 they're just very good at creating things which seem like if I don't have that, I'll die. <laughs> and then I buy, and then I have buyer's remorse and I buy something else. And that's the, the vicious cycle of consumerism. So um, a, lot of, a, a lot of that is sensor strength to just, just like with young people, the whole thing I mean, maybe old people are always complaining about social media and so on and so forth. But if social media are stimulating a kind of discontent, lack of security because of outside values and, and things you need to own, then that social media is, is kind of, uh, it owns you, doesn't it? You don't it, it owns you in a way which is very, very unhealthy. So I, I, I think what's really good actually, if, if young people can do it, is to do a retreat. Like go to a retreat where they take away your cell phone. No, no. Um, take everything away, all the distractions, and just bear with it for 10 days. See what happens. Do the, do the technique, Anapanasati, whatever they say. But for 10 days, you basically fast on the inputs of your culture. It's a culture fast, <laughs> not a fast culture. <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't consume anything. You don't look at anything. And what will, that will give you, it will give you, unless you go crazy, in which case you better go back. But for most people, what it gives you, it gives you a certain calm, a certain serenity, because you have stimulated the mind. That's one of the big things about designing a retreat. Now, because you haven't stimulated the mind, when you go back to your normal uh, environment, you'll see how your mind starts to pick up stimulations, how you gravitate to something. That gives you some insight into the addiction addictions of our culture. And then it's up to you to do the hard work of saying, of, of creating silent spaces in your daily life where that same contrast can be seen. So if I can create some silent space in my mind, that's samadhi, roughly speaking. Silent stillness, presence for a longer period of times. I can do that on a retreat. I can do that in morning meditation. If I do that, then as I enter into the complexity of a stimulating society, I can see what that does to my mind to some extent. And if I see that it's actually, this isn't really good, this is making me more whatever, not peaceful, I won't give a piece a chance, then my intuition will say, wait a minute, I've got to figure out my lifestyle where I get some more space, some more silence. Now, this means that you probably will lose all your friends <laughs> or some of them. <laughs> so that that that's one one people tell me this you know once they start to get into dhamma and they're not interested in partying or 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 buying or shopping you know a lot of their friends fall away which 
which you could kind of see how that works. Maybe you, you see who your friends are. But I do think that if you talk about Sama Samadhi in terms of an ongoing lifestyle, because sometimes Sama Samadhi is described in very, very high states of uh, elevated states of consciousness, but you, you live in a world where you can't do that. You can do that on a retreat or, or not, but where, does, where is Sama Samadhi in ordinary life? Is Sama Samadhi, right? right meditation, so concentration, is that just for a retreat? Or is it, ha, does it have a place in ordinary life? Well, it must. It must have a place in ordinary life. And I would say if you define Sama Samadhi as sustained silent knowing, and you can do that in the morning, that gives you a better insight into the habits of your mind, the habits of your culture. And you start to refine your friendships, your uh, sense inputs, uh, your, your whole lifestyle becomes bet more and more towards silence and stillness and compassion and so on. Now, but, but young people have a lot of energy, right? And you want to do a lot of stuff. So I did a lot of crazy stuff. And that's why usually monks, you know, monks only come when they're 30 because they do all the crazy stuff first. So, you know, if I was a parent, my, you know, my kids are a bit crazy. I'd say, well, maybe that's what it's supposed to be. I don't know. It'd be frightening. Um, so I wouldn't repress things and, and say, I have to be a goody good Buddhist because that won't work either. But you just if you want to give peace a chance and you, you intuit that, no, I'm getting confused by this culture or right? I don't, I don't believe in those cultural values, then you have to have some space, inner space to question that. And, and that way that worked for me when I was, I went to college for a few years, but I never graduated because I never felt that the, the university was answering my questions. And my questions were, were existential rather than uh, about right li livelihood. I could maybe do it now, but <laughs> now I understand my heart. But, but so my, my particular patterning was that I realized that I was about 21. I had to get out of my culture. I just had to get on the road, travel, and, and just figure out something about myself. I didn't even know what, away from all the cultural pressures of myself. Not, not, not that it's a bad culture. It's a very good culture. But I needed to think for myself. And I couldn't quite do that. I could be critical of my own culture, but I couldn't quite do that. And there wasn't, there wasn't much Buddhist information and so on and so forth. But kind of getting out of my culture, I began to be able to see my own mind and the kind of fundamental problems of my own neuroses and, and the problems I had as a human being. And that was tremendously helpful. So how do you do that in your own culture? All the kind of cultural pressures you have, brand names or whatever, well, I, I should think it's Kalyanamitta and silence, silent meditation. I, I mean, that, that seems to me. And retreats, retreats really kind of get you out of, out of those cultural pressures. There's no, easy, there's no easy answer to this, but seeking out places like a monastery, retreat centers, where, where, where there's a whole different value system. It's incredibly valuable. It gives you a kind of reflection on, 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 your, on your culture. I don't know if that's helpful, but there's some ideas there. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Longpa. Josh, can you just give me a second? Let me just ask one question, Josh. Thank you. Longpa, in follow-up to that um, question on Kalyamita, um, you mentioned about deep listening to someone as Kalyamita. Can you please reflect on how one can do this and still keep an inner silence? Well, the, you're, you're curious about the person rather than judging them or trying to so, quite often when a person comes to you with a problem then you immediately jump into some judgment and how you're going to help them fix the problem that's not deep listening that's just that's just opinion and i i had that with i i i've talked about this before very interesting i had uh when when my mom died um two i was she was alone with me, and and uh, I'm not a, I'm not a medical person, so I made a medical mistake in the third to last day that, that she was dying. I didn't know it would be the third to last day, and and uh, it caused her some pain and harm. 
not much, but still I felt it. Oh, I said, oh, he did that. So when, after she died, um, then even though I had taken care of it for nine years and really been good to her, this memory, this one memory came up. Oh, you did that. And it was a very, very uh, painful memory. And some people, if I talked about it to them, they would say, oh, but you were such a good son. You were such a lovely son. But they weren't listening to me. They weren't really listening to my pain. They were just saying, oh, I feel for you. But they weren't listening. But then a really good friend, a uh, monk, um, he really listened. And he didn't say, oh, you were such a good monk. He just listened and listened. And he said, wow, that's difficult. So he understood me. But most people that, that I, I didn't talk very many to many, many people because usually the answer was, was a kind of, um, it wasn't deep listening. It was just a kind of cultural thing. You say, oh, I feel for you. Or, you know, I feel your pain. I say, how, are you, how can you feel my pain? You know? <laughs> It's not possible. I can't feel your pain. So that kind of language of, of not listening is very common in our culture. That's an extreme example. But like what I, that's what I had to learn as a monk who talks a lot to people about Dhamma. You know, I had to learn not to try to solve people's problems. That's not my job. It's my job is to listen and just try to know them as a human being. Then if something comes, fine. If it doesn't, it doesn't. So you don't what you want to do is bring your mind to silence if you can bring your mind to the heart and be receptive who is this human being i don't know you who are you what's your story and then you ask questions you ask questions um not in an interrogative way but just to understand so how does that feel oh yeah gosh that's difficult i've never felt that and so on and so forth so it is, it is a receptive quality rather than an active quality of trying to figure out. J just to add to that, I was saying to the, the monk here, Kuba, not, I think I was saying it to you, I forget who. The first time I, had, I was in New Zealand and I was, you know, I was a young abbot in a monastery in a building and there was someone in, one of, in Hastings, one of the cities somewhere in, in, in north of us uh, who was dying. I think a Vietnamese man. Uh, and he was in, in the last days of palliative care, and the, they were, the family was searching around for a Buddhist monk, and they found me, and I went up there, and then I felt so anxious because I thought I had to advise this guy on how to die, <laughs> right? I think we all know how to die. No one has to tell us how to do it, but my, I wasn't really so, you know, I wasn't listening to this person. It was my own mind of how I can make sure he dies nicely or, or whatever, and I didn't do a very good job, huh? but then I learned that I learned, I, I don't have to do anything. I just have to listen and let, let the listening speak through itself. So when you're, you know, when you're, when you're doing deep listening, are you trying to fix the person's problem? Are you impatient? You want to get rid of them so you can go on to something else. Um, are you just giving Buddhist platitudes? That's quite often what we do. Oh, it's all dukkha. <laughs> or it'll change, Bhante. It'll change. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. You know, so we, we can use sort of these, these Buddhist platitudes, which kind of drive you nuts sometimes, don't you? So if I'm in deep grieving, right, and someone says to me, don't worry, Bhante, it'll change. Is that going to be helpful? Maybe. Maybe it'll be helpful. But if it's just being a good Buddhist and saying Buddhist things, that's not deep listening. That's cliches, you know, it's, it's, it's that. But in deep listening, when you allow the person's persona to be presented to you through their talking, through your questioning, then wisdom has a chance to say something, but it's not your intellect. Wisdom has a chance to say something. All right. Uh, Lampong, that's a question from George. Can I just invite right. Last question, Josh, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, thank you for greetings. Uh, so my question is, you know, in, in terms of problem solving and trusting in the awareness. So the thing is, sometimes you come into what I would call a sticky problem, something which, which needs that whole intellectual sort of stimulation, right. but then also 
sometimes intellectual stimulate intellectual uh, solutions aren't working. So when you say trust in the awareness, this kind of ties into what you were talking about with doubt. Right. So the thing, what I struggle with is um, when you come into one of these problems, I want to trust in the awareness. So is trusting in the awareness akin to taking a knotted string and placing it into water and letting it uh, unravel? Or does something come to you through awareness? Does are, are you waiting for something to come to you? I mean, being receptive rather than being uh, sort of more... Uh, you know, proactive. Sort of more proactive, yes. So just wondering when you say trust in the awareness, is 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 there something coming to you or are you just kind of waiting for the universe to, if, if the universe is the right phrase to use, I know what you to mean. actually solve the problem for you? Just, right. just wondering how, how, how you, you sort of uh, implement that. Well, what I look at is the desire to have an answer. So if, 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 if there's a naughty problem and I don't notice that I want an answer, then I keep thinking this, that, this, that, this, that, this, that. Yes, no, yes, no. And, and then I, I just never get anywhere. But if I just allow myself, oh, this is a feeling of, of, of wanting an answer. Then I'm making conscious the underlying tension. I still need to get the answer, sure. I need to make a decision, but can I just really make conscious? Here's a, here's a desire to uh, make a choice and I don't know. So then you're kind of behind the particular problem that you're in, A, B, A, B, and you're saying, oh, this, this is really feels uncomfortable. I don't know what to do. And just sit with that. See, I don't know what to do. I would suggest that within that, then the tension of desire has a chance to relax. And then perhaps a, a, a more, you know, a, a choice comes forward, not necessarily. And then when you don't know and you have to make a choice, well, you kind of say, well, that's the best I could do. And then if your mind starts to regret, you say, yeah, yeah, but, you know, that was the best I could do in that time. And, and no, no decision is perfect. But, you know, like one, you know, the joke we have that I use is like, if I have a difficult decision and I can flip a coin on it and I say, okay, heads I win, heads A, tails B, I flip heads and it's A and I don't like it, then I'll do B. <laughs> At least emotionally, that's what I'll feel like. But, but you know, that's just being facetious. But getting to that sense of discomfort and anxiety maybe is too strong of, of having an answer right away. And if you, if you, if you think about um, who was I with recently? Someone who, whose livelihood was higher maths and, and, and they were working as, a, a, as an assistant professor on some higher math problems. And this person would just kind of work, 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 trying to solve the problem. And they never allowed their mind to rest overnight. And that, I think that's classic in, 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 uh, creative ideas that you have to give the mind a rest to allow the subconscious to deal with the problem and maybe then an answer comes forward and I think that's where when you meditate and and then that question keeps coming up you you say to yourself wow I don't know I don't know I don't know you allow your mind to do that that's your best shot at it how, you know, it's nothing in life is guaranteed. But also I'd say, if it's a pattern, you know, sometimes like, you know, it's like life is between, uh, you're kind of between a rock and a hard place, right? It's very difficult. But sometimes it's also a pattern of decision-making. Then it's uh, probably easier to deal with because, oh no, this is that same old habit. Ah, uh, there it is. I, I want, I don't want to feel uncomfortable. I want an answer right away. So you, you're, then you're working with the Four Noble Truths. Desire, the attachment to desire, the sense of self that comes from that, and the witnessing of desire as an object. Does that kind of make any sense, yeah? Okay. Yeah, it makes, makes much sense, Lung Po, and thank you so much for, um, for that answer. 
Okay, be well. Thank you, Long Paul. Um, I do have a question for everybody. And the question here is, uh, everyone sees um, on your Zoom screen right now, there is a button called Reactions button. Um, if you would like to send love to Long Paul, uh, and uh, you, you, you agree that today's session is really um, a Buddha sent session for us to uh, still be connected to Long Paul. Go to your reactions button now and then send a, a, a heart, send a thumbs up, um, and, and just to give some encouragement uh, uh, to Long Paul on this occasion. Long Paul, could I ask that you switch to a gallery view so that you can see everybody? I have a gallery view and and I'm overwhelmed with the hearts and thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you, it's very kind. <laughs> you're, Bita, you're very creative as a facilitator. <laughs> well, we can do more things with me in person, right, Longford? This is the limited uh, expertise. There you go. <laughs> Next year. Next year. What to do? What to do? We have to. We have to continue to ensure that we're engaging you and that uh, we. Yeah. We maintain the, the welfare of uh, the Sangha. So, you know, brothers and sisters, uh, I, I do sincerely encourage you to continue to stay connected to the monastery and um, to, keep, uh, to keep them in, 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 your, in your metta and your meditation and uh, do continue to consider to support them. We've also taken up a lot of Long Paul's time on today's session, you know, for 90 minutes for someone who is recuperating, it's quite, it's quite hard to be sitting there for 90 minutes. It's um, great fun. It's great. <laughs> we, can, we can do again uh, when, when Longfall, um, when Longfall is, is much better and on his feet. So uh, I'd like to take this occasion to um, have sick, sick permission uh, to close uh, the session. But before Longfall, before we, we let you go, please know that you know our, our hearts and, and our, our meta constantly uh, have you in our in, in our minds and our dedication. Uh, we sent you, we do not understand the pain that you're going through, but we know there is um, a pain, but there's no suffering, but we keep you dearly, dearly in, in our uh, dedication always for a speedy recovery. Thank you, Vita. <clears throat> um, so with that, uh, we'll uh, ask for permission to, to close. Uh, Shun Xiang. Yes, uh, so we'll close the session today with the closing homage to the Triple Gem. Palms together, please. Arahang Samma Samputo Bhagawa Bhutan Bhagawantang Apiwate So wakato bhagavata namo namang namasami So patipano bhagavato sawaka sangho sanghang namami Three bows to Long Paul together please. Wow. Take care, Long Paul. Get well soon. Thank you, Shuzian. Okay, bye bye, everyone. See you next time. Don't fall. <laughs> <laughs> Don't fall.